Hi, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm director of the American Strategy Program of the New America Foundation. I'm here with Mustafa Barghouti, uh, leader of the Palestinian Initiative, a former candidate for president of Palestine. Uh, thanks for being here with us. I want to ask you Thank something you. today. Barack Obama gave a speech in Berlin, but he also recently visited and spent some time in Israel. As I understood, he spent about 32 hours in Israel and 45 minutes uh, on the Palestinian side. But um, you shared with me some thoughts about talking about walls, walls between societies, walls between cultures, and uh, share me. I just happened after having a meeting to watch him speaking in Berlin, and he gave a fantastic, very exciting speech. But one thing he said in Berlin, that walls should be abolished, and they should not exist between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. In Berlin, there is no wall anymore. I wish he would have said that in Jerusalem. I wish he would have said that in Palestine, where we have a wall that is three times the length of Berlin Wall and twice as high as it was, to convince people that a wall is not a solution of any problem. And I wish he had given more time to Palestinian side. I wish that in addition to visiting Sderot and other places, he would have the sensitivity of visiting at least a Palestinian refugee camp, or a school, or a kindergarten, or anything. So he could Just have given to show a, that there is some kind of a balance there. He could have given a game-changing speech. Yes, and in, he, should in have, I sh he should have spoken about the walls also there because I share his views about everything. But he cannot have change everything. Uh, he, he cannot have a change program in every place in the world, but exclude the Middle East. He cannot have a new approach to every other problem in the world, except the Palestinian issue, where he. He, he, there is a risk that he will just bring the same old tools and the same old approach. What he should understand, and I hope what American people and also Israeli people would understand, because I care for both people, Palestinians and Israelis, is that we are at the edge of losing a historic opportunity of two-state solution. If, if this does not happen very, very soon, we will end up having an impossible, irreversible situation of the possibility of two-state solution. A lot of us, uh, including myself, endorsed and supported um, Secretary Rice and President Bush's early efforts on Annapolis. Can you give us a quick snapshot? Uh, I think it, it's it, you, you shared with me some data that was unbelievable. A quick snapshot of realities before Annapolis and what we see today, and give us just a quick rundown of what the Palestinian citizen individual, I shouldn't even say citizen, there's no state, the Palestinian person deals with uh, in their circumstances today? As you said, Annapolis represented an uh, a, a hope for, some, for many people, but what happened since Annapolis is really shocking. Since Annapolis, the rate at which Israeli settlements expand in the West Bank is 20 times more than before. Since Annapolis, the number of Israeli military checkpoints have increased from 521 to 607. 521 to 607. That's the results of the involvement of Tony Blair, who was supposed to improve the freedom of movement. Since Annapolis, the number of Israeli attacks on Palestinians have increased by 300 percent. Since during the whole year of 2007, 404 Palestinians were killed and 10 Israelis or 15 Israelis were killed. During the period since Annapolis, more than 520 Palestinians were killed, including 70 children. In reality, what you have on the ground is unfortunately the evolution of something that can only be described as an apartheid system. Palestinians are prevented from moving around, more checkpoints on the ground, a wall that is cutting people from their work, from health services, from education. 85% of Palestinians did not leave their districts during the last six years. You have 11,000 people in prisons, and uh, more than that, you have a system which discriminates in such a bad way. A Palestinian citizen on average is allowed to use only 50 cubic meters of water per capita per year, while an Israeli, settler, an Israeli illegal settler can use 2,400, 48 times more than Palestinians. An Israeli on average makes, 11, uh, 11, makes $24,500 per, per capita per year, a GDP of $24,500, while a Palestinian makes only $1,000. But we are obliged to buy products at Israeli market price because we have this tax and market union. We have to pay twice the amount of money that Israelis pay for electricity and water. And the most drastic thing that has happened recently is segregation of roads. 
many main roads now inside the West Bank, I'm not talking about Israel, can only be used by Israeli army or Israeli settlers. If I am a member of parliament, caught driving or walking on any of these roads, I would be sentenced to six months in jail. I was born in Jerusalem. I worked as a medical doctor for, six, for, for 14 years in Jerusalem. And since four years, they prevent me from going to Jerusalem. Mustaf, it's a bleak picture. I want to thank you for being with us. I think about this issue of transportation. The last time we met, I couldn't get in to see you in Ramallah. You couldn't get in to see us uh, in Jerusalem. on the uh, Jerusalem side. And so we met at a gas station on a road uh, uh, outside of Jericho. And so um, I hope I hope we can meet here more often, and I hope the situation gets better. Thank you very much. And I hope next time we can meet in a more decent place in Palestine. <laughs> okay, thank you.